right, welcome everybody to the faculty colloquium. Today we're going to hear from Dr. Dan Apolito, and I'm going to give you a brief precy of his career. It's very long, so I'm just going to cut this down a little bit for time's sake so that we'll be able to hear Dr. Apolito's paper. Dr. Apolito received his BS in biology from Yale University in 1979 and his PhD in zoology from the University of Texas at Austin in 1985. His doctoral research focused on competition between an invasive species and native bass in a power plant reservoir in East Texas. After teaching marine biology at the University of New England in Southern Maine, Dr. Apollo took this position here at Anderson University, where he has taught for the past 26, probably 27 years? 30. 30. We need to update the website. For the past 30 years, uh, while here on faculty, Dr. Apolito has developed interest in the field of ecology and the philosophy of science. Today, Dr. Apolito will be talking to us about C.S. Lewis's moral law apologetics in light of modern evolutionary theory. Dr. Apolito. Thank you. Yes. And, and I have to say, I am grateful to the institution for allowing me to pursue these, these tangents. Uh, C.S. Lewis is probably best known for the Screwtape Letters and the Chronicles of Narnia. For my money, his best work is the Space Trilogy. But probably after the Chronicles and uh, Screwtape, he's best known for Mere Christianity. That's the book a lot of us loan to somebody who is exploring Christianity. I just loan my copy to a student, for example. Now, Mere Christianity is divided into several books. Um, and book one is entitled Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. He jumps right into it. Now, in the first three chapters, Lewis develops his well-known apologetic based on a universal moral law. Now, he had already de uh, developed that idea in the abolition of man, which, as you may know, is actually a series of lectures that were presented for the BBC. And in the abolition, he had pointed out the near universality across time and space uh, of moral norms. Uh, most cultures have injunctions against stealing, lying, giving false witness, along with commands to respect the elderly, give alms, and protect children and the weak. In chapter two, uh, Lewis rejects the idea that the moral law might simply have developed from or be an expression of the herd instinct. I mean, after all, Aristotle said we are social and political animals. Modern day evolutionary psychologists would call these the social instincts. And then in chapter four, Lewis concludes that the divine law must be of divine origin. Here is a quotation from mere Christianity. Um, the moral law or, or law of human nature is not simply a fact about human behavior in the same way as the law of gravitation is, or maybe simply a fact about how heavy objects behave. On the other hand, it is not a mere fancy, for we cannot get rid of the idea. And most of the things we say and think about men would be reduced to nonsense if we did. Now, in the abolition, Lewis had summarized the classic problem of trying to derive an ought from an is. He said, and I quote, from the statement about psychological fact, I have an impulse to do so and so. We cannot by any ingenuity derive the practical principle, I ought to obey this impulse. In the abolition, Lewis also said, if you say this will preserve society, that cannot lead to do this except by the mediation of society ought to be preserved. Now, once you start talking about the preservation of society, maybe especially at the cost of self-sacrifice, that leads us to the question of altruism. Now, um, this is the issue that had vexed evolutionary biologists. How can natural selection favor the evolution of altruistic behaviors? Until about 1975, when Edward O. Wilson published his famous book, Sociobiology, that's the discipline that we now call 
evolutionary psychology, which is a slightly less controversial term because, as some of you might know, uh, Wilson was a very controversial figure. Um, evolutionary psychology is based on the assumption that many human behaviors are genetically based. They may be culturally conditioned and modified, but the roots are in the genes. And therefore, those behaviors which enhance the propagation of an individual's genes will be favored by natural selection and spread through the population. Basically, those behaviors that help you survive and achieve a lot of copulations and have a lot of offspring spread because you are indeed passing on your genes. In this view, Apparently altruistic behaviors have to have an ultimate genetic payoff for the altruistic individual. Altruism is defined uh, as unselfish concern for the welfare of others. Now the annals of uh, natural history are replete with examples of animals that seem to risk their welfare for the sake of the group. This is a meerkat standing guard while the others forage for food. Prairie dogs do the same thing. Some species of squirrels do the same thing. Now you would think, well, the guard or the sentinel is at greater risk. If a predator shows up and they start screaming bloody murder, they're going to be the first to get eaten. So how could natural selection favor that behavior? Um, now, there are two possible explanations for this apparent conundrum. One is reciprocal altruism. In species that can remember, in social species, I scratch your back with the expectation that you will scratch my back. So it's not really unselfishness, it's more reciprocity. The other explanation, which is a little trickier, is kin selection. Kin selection proposes that organisms, mostly uh, the social animals, have a genetically based predisposition to behave altruistically towards those relatives who share a sizable fraction of their genes. So by helping them, they are indirectly favoring the perpetuation of their genes. Uh, this story may be apocryphal, but in the 1930s, the British geneticist J.B. Haldane is reputed to have said that he was prepared to lay down his life for eight cousins or two brothers at a minimum, because that way you break even in the genetic lottery. So reciprocal altruism and kin selection still ultimately confer a genetic payoff on the altruistic individual. And so there are still subtler examples of Richard Dawkins' selfish gene. Uh, now, I will concede that reciprocal altruism and kin selection go a long way towards explaining altruistic behaviors in the social animals but they fail to account for pure or universal altruism, the altruism that human beings can and do occasionally display towards perfect strangers. So my thesis is that I will argue in favor of Lewis's intuition that at least some aspects of the moral law could not have evolved by material mechanisms, but rather represent an ontological leap in the form of divine revelation. And I am borrowing this term from John Paul II's 1996 lecture to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. He used it in a slightly different context, but it stuck with me, ontological leap. I like that. In other words, uh, how can even kin selection explain the behavior of Mother Teresa, who was Albanian and cared for the, the poorest of the poor in Calcutta? or Oscar Schindler, who was a well-to-do businessman and who you know, stuck out his neck to help Jews during the Nazi persecution. A little aside, and then we will get to my main argument. A writer named Richard Alexander has proposed that the real evolutionary benefit of pure altruism is the enhancement of the altruist's reputation. And I quote, the main reward is reputation, 
in all the benefits that high moral reputation may yield. Reputation as an altruist pays. I assume he means it pays in more copulations. At the risk of engaging in the fallacy of arguing from personal incredulity, I find it hard to see how a high moral reputation necessarily translates into enhanced reproductive success. After all, celibate monks have historically enjoyed a good reputation. Uh, celibate female religious who help out in disaster zones have a high moral reputation, and presumably they are not spreading their genes far and wide. So, if straightforward selectionist arguments fail to account for human higher morality, um, what are we left with? There are two possibilities. Either human higher morality, pure altruism, is the product of culture, or it is divinely revealed as this ontological leap I've been talking about. Here are the two possibilities. Now, Francisco Ayala, the Renaissance man of biology, uh, tried to tackle this question. Um, he tried to split the difference between those two explanations. Now, he equates higher morality with ethics, and he defined it as the uniquely human capacity to evaluate specific behaviors as either right or wrong, moral or immoral. Now, he argues that the capacity to make those judgments is rooted in our disproportionately large brains and intellectual abilities. Uh, we have self-awareness, we have abstract thinking, we can anticipate the consequences of our choices. So Ayala says these intellectual capacities are the products of the evolutionary process, but they're distinctively human. Thus, I will maintain, I, Ayala, this is still a quote, that ethical behavior is not causally related to the social behavior of animals, including kin and reciprocal altruism. So he affirms the evolutionary, the organic, biological origin of our capacity for ethical behavior. But then he says that the specific moral norms according to which we evaluate actions uh, are the products of cultural evolution. In other words, the capacity to judge between right and wrong requires high intellect, and our intellect is an evolved faculty. But then the specific moral norms by which we judge specific behaviors are the product of cultural evolution. He is adamant that biology alone does not determine which specific moral norms are embraced and enforced by a particular society. I'm going to quote him at some length. Uh, a second observation is that some norms of morality are consistent with behaviors prompted by natural selection, but other norms are not. A hardcore sociobiologist would say that every norm, every cultural tradition, every ethical command ultimately has the goal of enhancing reproduction. Ayala is a famous geneticist, but he disagrees. He says, for example, also he studied to be a priest at one point in his life. The commandment of charity, love thy neighbor as thyself, often runs contrary to the inclusive fitness of the genes, even though it promotes social cooperation and peace of mind. If the yardstick of morality were the multiplication of genes, the supreme moral imperative would be to beget the largest possible number of children. And then he goes on to say, but to impregnate the most women possible is not, in the view of most people, the highest moral duty of a man. So he concludes, uh, moral norms are not determined by biological processes, but by cultural traditions and principles that are products of human history. However, he hasn't really answered the question. If biology is not, or not always determinative, of which moral norms are embraced by a particular culture, what else determines it? 
how do these norms originate if they are not determined by the genes? I mean, they may be enforced and perpetuated by cultural traditions, but how do they originate? Ayala, it ends up, sounds a little ambivalent about the role of both reason and religion in establishing ethical norms. He says, most people, religious or not, accept a particular moral code for social reasons without trying to justify it rationally by means of a theory from which the moral norms can be logically derived. Now, Immanuel Kant might disagree, but uh, this still doesn't answer the question, what are the social reasons? So we're back to Lewis. Uh, and uh, Lewis, even though he doesn't quite use those terms, he rejects both the sociobiological hypothesis and the cultural evolution hypothesis. Now, he does concede that our herd instinct may predispose us to help our neighbor, but he also points out that our more altruistic inclinations may come in conflict with other instincts, like the instinct for self-preservation. You know, the classic example of the drowning man. Should I save this person at the risk of my own life? Now, evolutionary psychology would argue that you're more likely to take the risk if the drowning person is a close relative or someone who can repay the altruistic gesture. Conversely, one should be much less likely to save a perfect stranger. At most, one might feel a very weak inclination to do so, born out of a general sense of conspecific solidarity. And I should mention that one other possibility here is that the moral law might originate from a sense of empathy, but that's really not quite within the purview of what I want to talk about today. Now, Lewis acknowledges this tension. It may even be that statistically, you are more likely to rescue a close relative or someone who can pay you back. But uh, you want to be safe more than you want to help the drowning man, especially if he's a stranger. But the moral law tells you to help him all the same. In other words, whether you do it or not, there is something that tells you you ought to be helping that person. Lewis says, at those moments when we are most conscious of the moral law, it usually seems to be telling us to side with the weaker of the two impulses. You probably want to be safe more than you want to help. And this leads to Lewis's famous tertium quid argument, the third thing. He says there is a third thing which tells you that you ought to follow the impulse to help, and suppress the impulse to run away. Now, this thing that judges between two instincts cannot itself be either of them. And this is an argument that he develops over and over, that uh, saying that we behave on instinct or impulse doesn't really help because sometimes, often, we have conflict conflicting impulses and no one can be a judge in its own cause. So if there is a third thing that sits in judgment of conflicting impulses, it cannot be just an impulse. It must be something else. In fact, uh, Lewis goes on to say that the moral law may encourage or suppress different instincts depending on circumstances. Uh, he says, there are no instincts that are invariably good or bad under all conceivable circumstances. There are occasions on which a mother's love for her own children or a man's love for his own country have to be suppressed or they will lead to unfairness towards other people's children or countries. So he concludes that the moral law cannot simply be another instinct. Nowadays, we wouldn't say instinct, we would say a biologically evolved adaptation. It is something else, Lewis says, which makes a kind of tune by directing the instincts. Now, one might still argue that altruism might have been produced by a process of cultural evolution. Um, 
maybe people are socialized to believe they ought to rescue someone who is drowning. Um, this for two reasons. One, again, is the commonality, the similarities in the moral codes of so many different cultures. And I would highly recommend, if you haven't already done so, to read the appendix to the abolition of man. Lewis goes to a great deal of trouble. He looks at uh, Old Norse. He looks at ancient Egyptian. He looks at Hebrew. He looks at uh, many, many different traditions. And they all pretty much say, don't kill the innocent, respect your parents, don't steal, don't lie. Uh, Lewis was an early foe of moral relativism. And he says that people tend to overemphasize the particularities and they tend to neglect the great similarities between moral codes. Um, you all know the anthropologists who make hay out of some obscure Amazonian tribes that engage in some horrific, you know, cannibalistic behavior or something like that. Well, that's an aberration compared to the great sweep of human culture. I mean, it's the sociological equivalent of a serial killer, you know, in a barren situation. Um, and then Lewis has a second reason for rejecting this. Uh, he, he points out that all people believe that some moralities are in some sense better than others. Um, if no set of moral ideas were better than any other, um, then why criticize Nazi morality? He says, uh, you can recognize the same law running through all cultures, whereas mere conventions like the rule of the road or the kind of clothes people wear may differ to any extent. Um, it's obvious that, and this, this is a little aside, um, I have become deeply convinced that absolute relativism doesn't lead to tolerance, it leads to tyranny. Because uh, when you argue with somebody else, you are implicitly appealing to an external standard. If there is no external standard to appeal to, then whoever screams the loudest or has the biggest club or holds the levers of power will prevail. Uh, now, I can't claim you know, credit for this idea. I mean, before he became Pope Benedict XVI, the last homily that Cardinal Ratzinger gave was entitled The Tyranny of Relativism. Anyway, going back to this point, um, Lewis says, the moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are, in fact, measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. You are, in fact, comparing them both with some real morality, admitting that there is such a thing as a real right, independent of what people think, and that some people's ideas get nearer to that real right than others. Okay, but Lewis wasn't a scientist. Lewis was a classicist. But two very well-credentialed biologists have taken up this idea. Uh, this is the Lewis quote. One is Francis Collins. You might have heard of Francis Collins. He was the director of the Human Genome Project, and now he's the director of the National Institutes of Health. He authored this book, uh, and he co-authored a second book entitled The Language of Science and Faith. And uh, he grew up in kind of an intellectual hippie household. He was an agnostic until his late 20s, until he decided that you can't remain agnostic forever about the things that really matter. And, and he was very impressed with Lewis's moral law argument. However, somebody who is not as well known, but who has developed it to a much greater depth is this gentleman, Daryl Domning. Daryl Domning is a professor of anatomy at Howard University. His actual specialty is the evolution of manatees. Uh, sort of like my actual specialty is fish ecology. But he also wrote this book, which made a tremendous impression on me. He wrote it in dialogue with a professional theologian. So he wanted a professional theologian to write little rebuttals and keep him honest. And 
he argues in this book for a new understanding of the doctrine of original sin. He argues that original sin is really uh, human self-centeredness, human selfishness, which does have a biological origin because if you don't look out for number one, you don't survive and reproduce. And so in chapter 9 of Original Selfishness, he says, he points out the non-Darwinian nature of Christian morality. He says, uh, Jesus, for, the, for Jesus to give such prominence to this idea, putting the interests of others on the same level as one's own, and not just from sporadic generosity, but as a consistent rule, was downright novel from the Darwinian viewpoint. And throughout his teaching, Jesus made clear that this pertained especially to the despised poor. In short, to those who not only would not, but could not repay. Here was something new. Here was altruism stripped of the very possibility of reciprocity. When he talks about the Good Samaritan, he says, Samaritans were despised enemies of the Jews. What Jesus meant was, who is your neighbor? Your enemy is your neighbor. Even the one you despise most is your neighbor. It is that neighbor's interest that you are to set equal to your own. And finally, Domning comes to the same conclusion that Lewis had reached 60 years prior. The moral law in its purest form, in other words, its most altruistic form, must be of divine origin. Now, Domning is a professional biologist. He's, an, he's a paleontologist, an evolutionary biologist. He's not the kind of person who would invoke miracle at the drop of a hat or resort to facile God of the gaps arguments. Earlier in the book, he has an extended critique of the intelligent design movement, for, for example. Um, but when it comes to pure altruism, he concedes that we are in the presence of an ontological leap. From reciprocal altruism to pure altruism may be a small extrapolation in pure logic. But Darwin was right in sensing what an impossible leap it is in the concrete world of biology. And this is really the clincher. Darwinian evolution was both necessary and sufficient to raise us to the jumping off point for such a leap by making us the conditionally altruistic creatures that we are. In other words, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, and so on. But it can carry us no further. Basically what he's saying is that evolution brought us to a point where we have intellect, we have self-awareness, we can anticipate the consequences of our actions. It even takes us to the point where we have some empathy, but we also find out how difficult it is to be altruistic all the time. And that's when we find out that we're in need of God's grace. And this pure non-Darwinian altruism is revealed most fully in the incarnation, in the, the teaching and preaching and example of Jesus. So why, after all, would a God who was content to let physical, biological, and cultural evolution take their course for billions of years suddenly step in with something as meddlesome as a direct revelation of the divine will? In other words, Jesus' teaching about pure altruism. Surely not for lack of patience. If we believe that such explicit revelation has actually occurred, then we can only understand it as necessitated by our own constitutional, read, biological inability ever to figure out the divine will on our own. You notice that usually the commands that Lewis talks about, don't kill, don't lie, don't cheat, respect your elders, at best are applied to members of the tribe or the clan, the social group, but, but here is a novelty. Here is, you know, help the Samaritan, you know, help your enemies. And so, um, the same God that had worked through secondary causes, in other words, physical laws, for billions of years, now has to step in, has to intervene in the Incarnation. <clears throat> 
So Lewis had partially foreshadowed Domning's insight uh, that our faith requires us to transcend our biological selfishness. Now Lewis calls it natural individualism. In membership, which is one of the chapters in The Weight of Glory, Lewis wrote, our faith sets its face relentlessly against our natural individualism. Read biological selfishness. On the other hand, it gives back to those who abandon individualism, again, selfishness, an eternal possession of their own personal being, even of their bodies. And so we've gone full circle. Thank you very much.